welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasurer, your source for interesting Treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. Liquidity matters. Simply being profitable is not enough. Maintaining cash that's needed for daily operations can be an interesting challenge. Today, we'll hear from Brent Kinman of CoreCentric as he shares stories of companies who attempted to optimize their working capital, followed by some unintended results. Welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Brent Kinman. Brent, it's good to have you on the Treasury Update podcast. Yeah, thank you very much, Craig, for having me. Delighted to be here. I wanted to begin with a definition of working capital, or maybe not a definition, but maybe your explanation of working capital. So what do you mean by working capital when you're talking with your clients? In most simplistic terms, it's just the cash that you have on hand that is used in day-to-day operations of your business, whether that's doing payroll or paying your AP bills or uh, anything for emergencies. Again, it's just the cash you have in your bank account to keep the lights on and keep operating. Does that include receivables? Or only when that converts to cash, how about payables or inventory? Is inventory part of the definition of working capital that you're talking about? Or is it more, hey, here's the liquidity I have to do those things? It's mainly around the liquidity that you have to do these things. As a practical definition for for those that uh, are not treasury or finance oriented, and it all manifests itself in something called the cash conversion cycle which is your inventory plus your day sales outstanding minus your day's payable outstanding. That cash conversion cycle, uh, as I'm sure we're going to get into it, really reflects the health of the business in terms of converting its inventory into real cash. Okay, great. Yeah, glad you brought up the cash conversion cycle. That, that measure of efficiency, like you said, of converting, putting cash into the business, converting it out, that's, uh, that's excellent. But when we talk about optimizing working capital or managing working capital, what are some of the core challenges or what is the core challenge with this business of optimizing working capital? What, uh, what do you, how, how do you describe that to your customers or how do you talk about that? I'll try and manifest the endpoint with an observation that I've made over the past 22 years. And it's, and it's really this. Not yet have I ever met anyone in corporate life whose title is head of working capital or a free cash flow optimizer or, or anything of the kind. And so the challenge is, is that it's not a centralized function and to optimize it requires the cooperation and shared responsibility across procurement, AP, AR, finance, and operations. It, it, it's really many hands make light work in this optimization, yet few, and in fact, none really that uh, I've ever seen organically rise up and, and, and manage this holistically without engaging outside help and without a dedicated uh, initiative to, to improve it. I like that description, but I also like your term about chief of working capital or person in charge, head of working capital, I think you might have said. That's a good description. Now, you talked about free cash flow. I thought you were going to quote from Stern Stewart, uh, the economic value added book. Maybe that's coming. You know, when we when you look at that, the, the chief of working capital, who should be managing working capital? Is it just this collective of people doing it, you know, all together? Or is by your saying it that way that there is a there tends to be a lack of focus in an organization on this, and that should be adjusted. Yeah, absolutely. In, in almost every successful case I've seen in an in industry of, of companies optimizing their cash flows and, wor- and working capital, most of the time it's led out of treasury at the behest uh, of, of the CFO many, many times. It is that coordinating and, and centralized function that seeks to align um, the cash that's effectively seized up in inventory, receivables, and payables. And then there are dedicated programs, which each one of those items, those, those variables of the cash conversion cycle that, that get ironed out and, and cash gets, if you will, effectively put on the balance sheet by either lengthening one's days payable outstanding, reducing one's inventory, 
or shortening the time of, of collection of payment from, from customers? You know, from a challenge perspective, um, there can be different areas of focus a company has. There's competing elements, whether it's the revenue, the assets, the income statement, the balance sheet. Maybe you could comment on that too. What are you, what are you seeing there in terms of most companies uh, focusing on different elements and is working capital taking a back seat? It totally is. I, I would say as a general comment that there is an income statement bias in the way as such that people get compensated and are incentivized within one's corporation. The sales force, let us say, right, is, is driven by a, by bookings and revenue, which are, are income statement notions. Uh, procurement and AP are largely on cost reductions. I have just noticed intuitively people can get the notion much more easily of, you know, buy low, sell high. In many people's minds, cash flow and working capital are, are somewhat abstractions to the mind. But mind you that my favorite quote about cash is, is from Warren Buffett. I'm going to highly summarize it. He says that cash is to a business as oxygen is to a human being. Rarely thought about when present, but all you can think about when not. Part of the issue in, in optimizing working capital is that the metric doesn't inspire. And so you have to really do two things, in my opinion, to get the function rolling towards optimization. Number one is it has to be in people's incentives plans and compensation structures, because otherwise they're going to be incented for something else, maybe to the detriment of working capital. As a best practice, the organization has to do a good job of connecting what that cash flow and working capital optimization will do in terms of tangible business outcomes. And so the most successful programs in this area that I've ever seen don't just put out a metric for achievement. Hey, we're going to lower our cash conversion cycle by 10 days, or we're going to put you know, $100 million onto the balance sheet. Most oftentimes, it is associated with a tangible business outcome, whether it's maintaining or increasing a dividend, whether it's entering a new market or a new product or, or entering a new geography, something that people tangibly can see as to why they're attempting to optimize one of those three variables, inventory, receivables, or payables, why they're doing it, I think makes as much difference as compensating them to do it in the first place. I would have to uh, concur with a lot of the, the stories and measurements that we see coming out of companies. There is a there is a stronger bias in most companies on income statement, but it you can't just focus on one, um, which is, I think, part of the story. I liked your point about metrics don't inspire by themselves, tie them to something tangible. With that, when we did a prep for this discussion, you shared a lot of stories and gave some examples, and I, I thought they were great. I, I would really like to learn from you on that uh, by talking about some of these stories or using stories as a way to convey that. Maybe the broader question is how can process success lead to unexpected or unintended results? I think sometimes we learn from the negative story. You mentioned um, they're tied together maybe at the top of the house as opposed to optimizing something below. And you can take these stories in different ways, but maybe we could start with some of the different areas because you cover a lot of these areas. And if I surprise you with an ex example or an area, don't worry, I'll, I'll provide one if you don't have it. But maybe we could begin with purchasing. I'm pretty sure you shared an example about purchasing or at least talked about that uh, the other day and didn't know if you had one that would, we can learn how some measure of success in purchasing can lead to the detriment of working capital. And therefore, we can all learn from that. When we talk about purchasing, let, let's talk about how, in general, w when I'm involved with a corporation, things work in, in homeostasis or, or the status quo. Back to that incentive metric, right? Purchasing is oftentimes incentive on, on cost savings, um, either piece rate or even total cost of ownership. But curiously enough, the total cost of ownership, either the equations or the, the formulas that they use don't include the time value of money in, in terms of payment term. They ignore it, yeah. It, it's totally ignored. Uh, you know, I will pay you a dollar in 30 days or a dollar five in 90. Procurement has almost, in, in many cases, uh, 
not a point of view. And so they will vote with their with their compensation plan and their wallet to go what maximizes the benefit of, of, of their particular function. But you know, back to these stories, I actually do believe that most working capital programs, the, the modern ones, come in the form of the, the business and namely the CFO and the CEO working with the board of directors and you know some initiative or business outcome gets decided at that level and then the the CEO and the CFO come back to the C suite and say hey we want to do this so in the, in the example of a consumer products company in, in the food space needed to do a total rebranding if you'll recall maybe 10 15 years ago gluten free just the secular trends in that industry were causing them to have to provide non-GMO foods. And there was this move towards uh, health and wellness and all of their products were, were kind of stuck in the, in the 19th century convention. And so they had to run a project to totally overhaul their marketing and their product mix and the ingredients even that they put in their food. It was going to cost them a billion dollars. And so they started to look, I'm sure, I, I wasn't there for the conversation, but like, hey, how are we going to pay for this transformation? And luckily, they had consultants who said, well, hey, we've got $580 million making that up, but some material portion of this project um, is stuck and seized in our inefficient operations. And oh, yeah, do you happen to know that compared to our competitors, we're paying our suppliers on average 37 days faster than the competition? And so it was that realization, a business outcome that they wanted to achieve, and then a strategy of working capital optimization on the payables end started to emerge. I want to be completely delicate in, in the fact that their actions to get fair market terms with their suppliers was not predatory. Again, we, we tend to think again in, in this notion of a price income statement. I can promise you every professional procurement department in the Fortune 2000, if they discover that their competitor is getting a better price, I promise you that day, right? They are calling up and getting that price. But why not with term? Really the same notion. And yes, there's, oh, well, different specs and, and this and that. But at the end of the day, term is a real economic value lever. And so systematically, they benchmarked all of their terms with their suppliers and then funded or initiated several different payables programs to increase their days payable outstanding. It's, it's just that simple. And they used anything from uh, dynamic discounting, early payment discounts uh, to fund some of the program. They had supply chain finance, which is another traditional mechanism by which many times when a buyer has a, a lower cost of capital than a supplier, there you can get a bank to step in between the two and pay one early and then the, the bank gets paid back later. And oftentimes we call that rate arbitrage, right? Where both parties are actually better off in that scenario. They used virtual cards. And, and then as all of that kind of one-time push was going on, they instituted policies and procedures so that they trained procurement on the, the time value of money in the payment term sense and gave them tools and techniques that upon the negotiation battlefield, if you will, right, they could make a fair economic determination as to what the best total cost of both price and term meant and ultimately funded the majority of this billion dollar program simply grabbing it if you will out of their out of their payables uh, they wasn't predatory and they were moving them to to regular terms you know there's this not accounting for the time value of money and and the overall market i think there's another aspect of that too is if you're paying you know sooner or you're let's say you're collecting maybe less on the purchasing side but if you're collecting a lot slower, you also have a greater risk there. If we look at the receivable side or the sales side, what, you know, letting people pay later has a time value of money, but there's also a greater likelihood of more uncollectability, which we don't normally think about there. So that's a great story on the purchasing side. Do you have any stories on the sales side? In terms of receivables, it's a beautiful uh, example of the interconnectedness of departments when it comes to working capital. When we here at CoreCentric are, are talking to, you know, a customer, our potential customer of ours, we want to talk to their sales force 
Because ultimately, on the other side of procurement with payables, right, there is a salesperson who is also offering some payment term in the, the facilitation of a transaction, getting into one's CRM system and setting policies as to what sales can do and not can at least at the very front end of the process preserve one's day sales outstanding just by virtue of now making salespeople think about it and thinking about that order to cash cycle, not just about closing the transaction at hand. I've seen a lot of innovation beyond just traditional factoring in the receivables um, market. Some very interesting large technology players that run some of the larger business commerce networks that are out there have incredible insights into facts and data. For financial institutions and fintechs that want to fund these receivables, which is to say pay the supplier early and then s- collect the uh, the payment from the buyer at a later date and then charge some sort of financing fee to the supplier, these large business networks with appropriate permissions, right, with data security and privacy are peeking into the, the commerce networks and empirically seeing how that supplier is performing. We are literally in round one of this on the innovation scale because traditionally a supplier who wants to finance their receivables basically has to give the financier a data dump and, you know, is it accurate? You know, are they, the data is stale. Financiers would rather peer in and see what's going on, verify who their customers are, see the behavior of, of what's actually going on. And at least my personal witness to this is that uh, receivables finance could could be quite high. We're talking, depending on the financial uh, quality of that supplier, you know, even 15, 16, 17 percent APRs that suppliers were were getting to sell their receivables. These commerce networks have provided data and information to the financiers that has driven that down. I've seen it as low as eight, nine, ten percent APR, which again, in the span of five years, irrespective of interest rates and, and global economic factors, just that visibility has done a good service, if you will, to the invisible hand of capitalism allocating precious resources, you know, where, where they can be most efficiently utilized. But again, just like on the payable side, the connection between the receivables organization, AR, the the sales force and the order to cash organization, having a goal in mind and what this will mean, not just in terms of the metrics, but what the business can can do with the cash makes all the difference in the world in making these programs work. You know, Brent, some of the um, improvements that happen on the the efficiency side of making the cash conversion cycle run more rapidly, sometimes that creates unintended results. I know you had shared some examples there. You know, I want to get to the to tap into the strategies and tactics that you often use to help companies do better with their working capital liquidity, optimize it, typically reducing some of these inefficiencies or uh, trapping cash that doesn't need to be stuck there. Whether you go back to you know, examples like we were stepping through purchasing and sales and AR. Um, it may be something with AP and Treasure, but I think you have, um, you can talk about how those changes have occurred and how changes may have unintended consequences, but changes can also precipitate other changes. You know, I know one one was on the AP side uh, that you had, and I, I think that's really instructive to us just to think about how we uh, how we act. Yeah, th- there's a certain irony to this story that I think will illustrate uh, the point. Let's strictly talk payables for a moment. If your AP process is not in order, let us say, which I define as being able to pay a, any given supplier on the day of your choosing, right? A, a working capital program that incents suppliers to take early payments or accept supply chain finance or early payment dis- discounts, all those things that are tools of the trade to help one drive their day's payable outstanding to something that is more market competitive, right? If you can't do that, if the underlying technology and process isn't efficient enough, then a working capital program on the payable side is not for you. It's just not. This brings to mind a, a story of a company who we talked with about this. And 
they agreed with us that uh, that was going to be the first step. They actually had a decent days payable outstanding, but not for the reasons that you would think. The reason that they were doing okay in that area is because it simply took them that long to process an invoice and, and actually pay it, which was rarely on time. And one of their unintended consequences early on is doing a technology implementation project to get AP workflow automated and captured digitally and all of those great things. They went ahead with that project with the company that I was with, and it was great with the exception of it caught Treasury off guard because now invoices could be paid on time. So there was a mad scramble of basically trying to bolster the cash position and, and stabilize it as effectively the, the prerequisite technology that they needed to improve overall went in. It actually had the reverse effect. They were simply now able to honor the terms that they had in place. So these things, again, need to be, I, I call them the three amigos, uh, sometimes in jest. Um, I get snickers when I hear that, but the, the three amigos are treasury, AP, and this is payables focused, and, and procurement. And without the alignment and, if you will, even a council, the working capital council, on the payables end, that, those are the three. And they have to, A, have their scorecards aligned, especially at the leadership level, but even on the brass tax of we're now going to entice suppliers into an early payment program, right? If that's not done in, in, in concert with Treasury 10, 15 years ago, we, we've run some companies, uh, you know, out of some cash and instituting w what is a good thing, but kind of in isolation of, of one of the other functions. So, Brent, is that an example of, you know, the cycle time to get an invoice in approved and ready to payment dropped down? let's say dramatically, just became far more efficient. They were paying earlier because our process was so slow, we pay it when it gets approved and that's always late. And so that's just the next event. And now it got, it sped up. Now they're paying when it's approved, but you knocked off a bunch of days. Now you're paying early. Yeah, in this particular case, uh, well, I'll just, I'll use some hypothetical numbers. Their days payable outstanding was about 37 days because it literally took them 36 days to approve an invoice and put it in for payment. And, you know, the supplier would get paid overnight when they implemented an AP workflow tool and optimized their processes, digitized the capture of those invoices on the way through the door. Now they were getting invoices approved in five days and systematically they could pay on the 30th day like they were supposed to. That was the unintended consequence of improving the function from AP's perspective, but uh, yet Treasury really not grasping, you know, that they were going to accelerate on average every payment seven days because now they could. The improving the efficiency on the, the payable side procure all the way through payment, uh, there was that perhaps a uh, the mechanism of releasing payment when it was due was was one aspect of that. Anything uh, anything else in there that that we should think about? Again, just focusing in on payables for a moment on an operational level beyond the hey, let's tie this to a business outcome and not just a metric. You know, let's drive incentive plans across procurement AP and treasury so that everybody's aligned harmoniously across the various functions. When you get into the implementation of these kinds of programs, a lot of it has to do with supplier trust. From my comment earlier, if you want to optimize your day's payable outstanding, you're probably going to use virtual cards or dynamic discounting or, or supply chain finance. Um, but the supplier has to trust you that you will pay them on the day that you say you're going to pay them. Because oftentimes this is a value exchange. Uh, let's just take the early payment discount scenario where maybe you have a supplier um, you know, that's on a net 30 term. Um, oftentimes what corporates will do is say, look, I'm I want to change your net term to 45 days. But in exchange for that, I'll give you the ability to accelerate your payment even down to like five days. So there's this value exchange. Hey, I'm going to give you flexibility. I'm going to give you basically, you know, a friction free way to accelerate your receivables for a supplier. But the supplier has to trust you. They, they, it, there's this, this trust equation between AP and AR. 
I've seen a lot of programs go wrong when the promise is not delivered from AP. In other words, the supplier selects a discount to be paid 25 days earlier, and yet they're paid at the net term minus the discount. So th- that's that's why you must have, again, on the payables end, you must have one ship in order to make these programs work because, again, at the operational level, it requires trust. That'd be a little hard to accept, right? I've Basically, I've offered a lower price then without the increased level of flexibility for when I collect my cash. I don't see it as much these days, but uh, you would be aghast 15 years ago some of the horror stories uh, of suppliers offering early payment discounts or trying to take supply chain finance and ultimately giving up the the discount and still being paid at net or or accepting a virtual card and the same thing. Those programs don't go very far. I want to hear another story that uh, highlights some of the tactics or strategies that you use, but we have a lot of treasures in our audience Maybe you could share anything that you see. What makes a successful or great treasure in in the realm of working capital management versus what might be an indication of maybe they're not uh, going to be a great working capital management treasure? My view of treasurers is uh, there are two types. Sorry, treasurers out there. Um, Maybe there are more. The ones that have CFO aspirations and, and those that don't. Neither is right or wrong. Ultimately, I believe a successful working capital program is going to require Treasury to get out there in the business and mix it up with other leaders of the business and ultimately drive the C-suite, which is tough, right? This is managing up. Like I mentioned before, corporate decisioning is quite uniform in in how big decisions get made. Most of the time, it's the CFO and the CEO deciding what they're going to do with the board. Then they come back to the C-suite and they say, okay, we need strategies to do this. It's at that point where the treasurer, if they know that there's a lot of cash seized up in, in payables and receivables, could offer up a working capital program as yet a strategy in the organization that can help the board and the CEO manifest one of these outcomes. That, that's the best way to do it. The other style of treasurer will just use the metric. Hey, let's put $200 million on our balance sheet, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That, I've just never found that metrics driven motivation to inspire the kind of cooperation that's going to need to pull one of these things off. Otherwise, you know, go get an ABL or some other source of financing, you know, to create a new product line or anything else. It is money that is available to the firm as long as you're not being predatory in the market. I want to stress that. You should pay your suppliers when everybody else does. And you should pretty much aspire to collect your money when all your peers do. I don't know if you've noticed in food and beverage, their average days payable outstanding was probably 60 days in 2012. It's now past 120. Um, they have gone so far out there um, that it, it's given you know this kind of optimization, even maybe a little bit of a black eye. Sorry, food and beverage out there. And if you're behind the market and catching up, being able to demonstrate as a treasurer that you can coordinate, drive consensus and agreement across multiple functions at the same time is oftentimes a feather in one's cap to you know taking that next step as a CFO. Remember the Wimpy Burger, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. I think in the food and beverage, you're saying, I will gladly pay you in August for a drink today. That's a pretty interesting number there. And and then your point about, you know, if you look at a process, I'm, I'm always, uh, I say this quote too much, so sorry for those who regularly listen to the podcast. The, if you optimize part of the process, you sub-optimize the whole to fix the process, you have to look at it from an end-to-end basis. And that's what you're saying is there's one type of treasurer who says, we have to look at this from a cross-functional perspective. And the other one that says, hey, I'm just going to put out some numbers and hope people get to it, or I'll only work on optimizing things within my direct sphere of influence because I can only influence others, not command. Absolutely. More more brilliantly architected and articulated than I, than I put it, yes. 
<laughs> I, I I don't know about that, but um, but I do want to hear another story. I don't know if you have another one in the hopper about um, yeah, different strategies or tactics that companies have used to optimize things, including where they, you know, there's always this adjustment. When you make those adjustments, there's other learning that takes place, and it takes a you know iteration or two, just like learning to ride a bike, to get that smooth flow and realize that. Do you have a final great story for us? Yeah, sure. Probably the most spectacular use. And I, I hope many of your listeners are, are familiar with some of these uh, AP products that are offered in the uh, marketplace. This is a spectacular use of uh, supply chain finance uh, in, in the uh, food and beverage industry. Again, by the way, I got I to gotta give a shout out in the, in the beverage industry. I believe that this push on payables began with the beer manufacturers. If you can hear their story about from the moment that, you know, they begin making the product until when it absolutely gets sold, it, it's a tough business. They, they, they have horrible cash conversion cycles. This player in the industry wanted to make a spectacular acquisition and they just were not in the financial shape. Their balance sheet was going to cause all sorts of problems in acquiring the, their target. And so, the, you know, they sat down with their supply base and said, look, this is actually better for you too, what we want to do, right? We want to push our payables out. We're going to get you early funding through a bank. But ultimately, if we are able to convert on this strategy, the ultimate end of it is that we're going to be able to buy more from you. So they engaged one of the prominent fintechs out there. I, I won't mention them by name, but uh, they're in the supply chain finance space. And ultimately, we were able to drive their payables to the tune of several hundred million dollars of cash that quickly got under the balance sheet. We're talking in under eight months, which then allowed them to retire some debt, which then allowed them to get the financing to make this acquisition there is a tangible manifestation of everything we've been talking about. The board was on board, right? The CEO wanted to make this acquisition. The strategy was set because this is the primary one that they had to execute on. Procurement, AP, their financier partners, their technology partners all got read in and they executed it beautifully. And now you have a new entity, the combination of those two, in much better shape and claims much more market share than they did before. And in many cases, not all, but the suppliers that that serve them are, are certainly better off today than they were pre-merger. So that's a feel-good story on the kinds of things that uh, optimizing working capital can do for an organization just beyond simple metrics. It's a lot more than um, an interest because you're talking about beverages, whether it's uh, coffee, soda, beer, you know, you also brought that that aspect of it was they were optimizing their working capital and they made the pitch, not just like, hey, I'm going to extend my terms, but now I can also buy more. And that changed the, okay, I can give a little bit up on, now I'm collecting 120 days, but now I'm selling more and I make quite a bit more margin than my cost of, my cost of capital by funding uh, you as a trading partner, a really, really great story, Brent. Just not let this fact be be lost. And when COVID kicked off, there were some pretty neat stories about how to bring in technology providers and, and financiers to improve the health of the supply chain. Th that is a reason, believe it or not, to optimize one's payables as well, because uh, the ability to buy more or to give suppliers if you will, shame-proof mechanisms by which to control the timing of their payment is another worthy goal that is kind of wrapped around, um, you know, just optimizing, you know, inside your four walls. It can have big effects to, to your supply base. This is an unfair question, but uh, I know you'll be able to handle it. Just-in-time inventory used to be such a big deal as a way of moving stuff off our balance sheet. Given supply chain disruptions, that we've seen over the last, oh, I don't know how many years, has that fallen greatly out of favor or is it still applicable in certain industries? Let's go to automotive real quick because I think th this is the most illustrative story out there about uh, the thinning supply chains and the disruptions with just-in-time inventory. 
the TPS, I believe it's called the Toyota production system. Um, and all the lean manufacturing principles that came out of that. Well, if you even look to this day, right, Toyota never ran out of inventory. They didn't run out of chips, but yet they were the ones that kicked off this secular trend of just in time inventory. I think many in the automotive industry, but in others, they read the book, Elliot Goldratt and, and all the, I forget the theory of constraints and all those kinds of things. They misread what Toyota was actually trying to say in terms of supply chain resilience. So ultimately, the industry, and from an in- inventory perspective, thought that wherever you see inventory, whether it's work in progress or final or final stock, that was where the inefficiencies are or were. And to some degree, they're not wrong, but they took it to the extreme to where they did not account for some of the disruptions. So, it, you know, just like the chip shortage that we're in right now, that's a critical component that makes a car go from A to B. And um, someone decided we should keep that. We should literally be pulling it off the truck and putting it in the car. Toyota never said that, um, but a, lo- a lot of the auto, man- auto manufacturers and, and, and those that serve them certainly did. So uh, it, be careful with inventory. It is the largest swing in most cash conversion cycles. That's about the uh, maximum expression. Be careful that I can give you. Maybe a topic for a different day. I liked your oxygen example on this one from the automotive industry is good as well. I have a friend who used to say, a nickel holding up a dollar where there's something that holds it back. And it's like, I don't know what those chips cost, but cars don't cost a dollar some good lessons learned across the board. Brent, thank you so much for your uh, comments today on working capital, optimizing it, the view of treasurers. Very much appreciate you talking about working capital management foundations with me today. Craig, it was great talking with you and uh, look forward to us catching up soon. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.